That was quite perfect. If you were too far back, a little bit more, please. If you were too far back, you couldn't see your face. That's what got me. Because you were smiling while you played, which told me you had joy in your heart as you sang about the everlasting, fantastic love of God. I was very moved by that. Thank you, my new young friend. I made a new friend this week, too. My new friend um, is from the Ivory Coast in West Africa. My new friend is named Kingsley. Now, I know some other Kingsleys in my life, but I never met this Kingsley. His wife, his name, Patience. Isn't that a great name for a wife? Patience. I love that name. I'd never met Patience and Kingsley until Sunday. Kingsley is the executive secretary of the West Africa Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I had the opportunity, along with Jennifer, my wife, who is also patient, we had the opportunity to host, at the request of my North American Division secretary, colleague Alex Bryant. My job as union secretary was to host a group of the division secretaries of the world, which ended up being 12 of them, coming to the Pacific Union. And I knew about this in February, and so we began to plan how we would show them who we are. And as we did that, we laid out a very detailed itinerary along with myself and some of my colleagues from the union office. And some of you are here today, my colleagues. You didn't have to do the tour, but I'm nice to see you today. And so we, they landed at Orange County Airport last Sunday. Jennifer and I and our team met them. They went to the El Monte Vietnamese Mission Center. If any of you have been there, if you have not been there, you must go. It is the most phenomenal work that is being done, not only for the Vietnamese people, but for the work in that part of Los Angeles. We left there and went, got something to eat. They went on to Loma Linda for half a day, and then Monday afternoon, evening, they came back to La Sierra University, came to our archeology span center that's at La Sierra University, which is the largest holding of archeology span in the United States, it's in the church. It's bigger than the one at Andrews. And it was Larry Garrity, who used to be president of La Sierra, who's also been the leader of archeology span for the Seventh-day Adventist Church for many years. We heard this statement, by the way, Seventh-day Adventists are the last leaders of biblical archeology span in the world. Do you know why? Because we believe that this book is actually true. And so we want to find and show the things of history and so forth are there. So from there, we left La Sierra. We went to the church. We had a worship service at the La Sierra University Church. The next morning, we all got on a plane, flew up to Sacramento, did a wonderful tour and presentation of the new $150 million Adventist Health Building. By the way, your tithe money is not paying for any of that. It's all Adventist health money. Then we drove over to a place called the Veg Hub in Oakland. Have any of you heard of the Veg Hub? Well, if, you, if you're in Northern California Conference, you know all about it because it is a urban vegan cafe that is in the space between the emerging uh, upper class area of Oakland and the original neighborhood in that part of Oakland. We went there, and by the way, there was 50 of us. We all go there. We descended on this restaurant and had several hours of absolutely charming and delicious fellowship together. So what's beginning to happen is, is that these World Division secretaries who don't know any of us, we're all becoming friends. And we're getting to know each other. And most importantly, they're getting to know what it is to do ministry in the United States, and particularly here in the West, in the United States. We leave there, and the next morning, 
we meet them at Pacific Union College where they go to the Nelson Memorial Library and they get to see a document that was a letter that was discovered in the library holdings of Pacific Union College, which was a letter that Ellen White had written to a man that no one ever knew about until about three months ago. And so we talked about that letter and they got to see it. We gave them a facsimile copy of it. And then we went and worshiped in the church and Ricardo Graham gave a very nice devotional. And then we went to what we thought was the spiritual highlight of the tour is we went to the home of Ellen White at Elmshaven. Elmshaven is owned and operated by the Pacific Union Conference. It's the most beautiful historic building and grounds that I've ever seen around the United States. How many of you have been to Elmshaven at some time? Good. If you have been there, go back. And if you have never been there, it's not really a pilgrimage. That's not right for Adventists to talk about a pilgrimage. But you must go. You must see it. Because it's living history when you walk in to the parlor where Ellen White, beginning on her return from Australia, spent 15 years of her life before her death at Elmshaven. She wrote a number of important books like The Ministry of Healing and Acts of the Apostles and Education. She wrote literally thousands of articles of, and letters to all kinds of people from Elmshaven. And as we were there, they had the tour. We had a nice meal outside underneath the trees. And then we came to the commitment service at Elmshaven. And Charles White, Charles White is a friend of mine and a friend of many of yours. Charles White is the great-grandson of Ellen White. And the great-grandson of Ellen White got there, and he told some stories, talked about the message of God through his great-grandmother. And then at the end, he offered a commitment service where we all prayed together and committed ourselves to the work of God in Ellen White's living room. And then we left. And we had dinner, and the next morning, they got on their way. Why am I telling you all this? I don't mean it to sound like I'm showing you home movies, you know, of people's trips. I'm telling you this for a, a very important reason. Seventh-day Adventist Church is a big church. We have 20 million people. You may be surprised to know that we really don't know each other very well at all globally. Nobody ever sits together and talks. We never meet together at meetings. We're segmented by where we go and have meetings, and this is why most of these folks have never been west, because all the meetings are in Columbia or Silver Spring, Maryland. So, Pastor Roblo, something happened. The second day, Kingsley, the executive secretary of West Africa Division, we're waiting at the Ontario airport, and I was going around greeting people, and he literally stood up, he grabbed my hand, and he said, you have no idea how happy I am to be here. You have no idea how much I have learned, even just in a few days. And it began to be reported to us by the other folks that were in our tour. There was if scales that had come off their eyes. That they said, we now think we understand more. First of all, and this is the part that hurts, and yet it's wonderful. You really do care about the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North America. Yes, we do. You really do have a passion for the Bible in North America and in the Pacific Union and in California. So here's the thing that I left with when Jennifer and I got on the plane and flew home on Thursday, quite tuckered out. It made the text in Isaiah 53 make sense. He hath seen the travail of his soul and is satisfied. It was a travail of soul, but very satisfying. Why? Because it made me realize yet again that what makes us as Seventh-day Adventists a global church is not policies and procedures, Sabbath school quarterlies, 
and those kinds of things. What makes us a global church is because we're united around one central passion. And do you know what that passion is? It's the passion for Jesus. It is a passion for the cross of Christ. It is the difference we want that to make in the lives of somebody. Whether we live in the Ivory Coast, whether we live in Western Europe, Australia, Asia, and even Canada, the United States, and Mexico, and Inter-America. So here's the text. That's my theme text. You guys don't have a clock here. Oh, there you do. What times the pastor usually get done here? Really? 1230? Oh, we're not going to do that. It's going to... Because, you know, um, I could fill the time, but I actually want you to hopefully remember what I say. So I'm going to give you a text. I'm going to give you an Old Testament illustration. I'm going to tell you a story, and then I'm going to punctuate it with the close. So here we go. So here's the text. It's in John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 32. This is the thesis statement of what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist in a global world. And it doesn't matter what culture I come from. It doesn't matter what my language is. It doesn't matter what kind of family situation I'm in. It doesn't matter on any of those. Because Jesus speaks an eternal principle that guides the church today in these days. And here it is. Simple statement. And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. If I am lifted up, I will draw, and actually the original Greek doesn't use the word peoples. It's in italics, which means it's added in by the translators. Jesus says, if I am lifted up, I will draw all to myself. The power of the cross is of such profound nature that it will align every part of creation to the way God designs it to be. It begins with the human heart, sin eradicated. It moves into social relationships and it heals the brokenness of racism and sexism and classism it does all those things through the power of the cross. And then it moves beyond that the power of the cross will actually heal the broken climate of this planet. Because by all indications, humanity is on the pathway to wreck it completely. And, and here's the wonderful news, it reaches beyond this one terra firma planet it goes to the universe, and God says through the cross, he will actually realign the galaxies and the universe to be, again, one heartbeat of love forever. That's the cross. Now the Old Testament story. Where did Jesus get the idea that if I am lifted up, I will draw all to me? The answer is in an Old Testament story in the book of Numbers. So if you go with me to the Old Testament book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 21, beginning with verse 4. It's just five verses long, but it's a powerful story because it begins as oftentimes things do on an adventure that God's people were on. They've left Egypt, and now they're on their way to the new land that has been promised to them, but something happened on the way. Verse 4 of chapter 21 in Numbers, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And what does it say? The soul of the people became very discouraged on the way people got tired and the people spoke against God and they spoke against Moses usually when we get into problems sometimes our human nature is why is God doing this to us 
And then, of course, we find somebody else to complain to it, about it too. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food, no water, and we are sick and tired of eating this worthless bread. By the way, do you know what the worthless bread is? It's manna, the bread that God supplied for them. So what happens? Verse 6, So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. We should pause there, by the way. God doesn't send, doesn't send serpents to kill people, but here's what God did do. It says God sent serpents, but what we do know from the Old Testament was that God's hand was upon the people of Israel, and he was with them as they traveled. So, and you read about things like their sandals didn't wear out. And you read about things like, you know, he said, I don't want to have any of these diseases of the Egyptians on you. See, it was all predicated on the idea that when they followed in God's way, God was able to give them the preservation that he desired. And so really what was happening was God's hand held all those nasty snakes away. But then by the choice of Israel to say no, God, I don't want you doing anything for me. I want to be on my own. And what God does, and in the book of Romans, it says God gave them up. And God gives them up and says, okay, I'm going to honor your free choice. And so, as if a gate is opened, God steps away, and what happens? All those nasty snakes that are around there in the, in the desert all come after all those people. And... I can remember when I used to read this story in Uncle Arthur's Bible stories that my mother got me when I was a little boy. By the way, I got paid $1 for every one of those 10 volumes, so I made $10 for reading each of those. It was worth $10. I always remember the picture of the snake slithering underneath the tent flap and coming silently towards some little boy who was about my age. And the next thing we know in the story, the venomous snake has bit this little boy. And that's repeated all through the camp. People are bitten everywhere. And suddenly, people are dying. And there is like a plague of poisonous snakes that are all through the camp of thousands and thousands of people and tents. And so guess what happened? They said, you know, maybe we were a little hasty saying that God's done all this bad stuff for us. You know, God really probably is the answer for me. So, God, we have another thing that we want to talk to you about. And that's what the rest of the story goes. It says in verse 7, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, and you notice what it says, We've sinned. We've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And by the way, that's one of those conditions that happen in life. Is when I realize that I have separated myself from God, the best thing to do is to come back and tell him, God, I was wrong. And by the way, that's not bad advice to do with people, too. You know one of the most disarming things to say to someone? I'm sorry. I was wrong. So what does God do? God doesn't just do something like wave his hand or send an angel and suddenly everybody's better. Because God wanted to use this as a teachable moment. So what does he do? The Bible tells us that Moses had a bronze serpent image made resembling the serpents that were actually out slithering around the camp. And this serpent is put on a pole. And there it is put up on a stake so that everybody in camp can see it. Now, I don't know if you were really far away, if you had the real cheap seats in the camp, you would have had to squint pretty hard to see a serpent, but you would, this gold bronze serpent, but it would be glistening in the sun. 
And the Bible says that God said that if you will look on the serpent, you will be healed. And sure enough, they were. God healed Israel when in faith they looked, believing the promise of God that they would be healed, they looked and were healed. Jesus says, if I am lifted up, I will draw all to me. Jesus incorporates the power of that old story about a serpent. Instead of it being a serpent, it is now Jesus that is lifted up. And we know how it happened. We know that Roman soldiers nailed Jesus to a cross. We know that Jesus was lifted up and placed in the ground so that all who could see him there would then have a choice to make. In the same way that people in Israel had a choice centuries ago to either look at the bronze serpent or not look, people had a choice to look to Jesus or not. And I remember one of those who did immediately. The power of Jesus lifting, lifted up already had impact. The, the, the Roman soldier who was in charge of the execution squad said, surely this was the Son of God. The thief on the cross that was next to him, there of course there were two of them, he says as he looks at Jesus on the cross and he perceives the power of God in Christ, he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today I say unto you, you will be in par with me in paradise. The immediate power of the cross. So what's the mission? What's our mission? What's our global mission? Our global mission is to do just that. Ellen White was an evangelist for many years, besides being a prophet to this church. And one of the things that she said was that God had a work for us to do in lifting up Jesus. And one of the things that she wrote in a manuscript in clear back in 1901 when she was living at Elmshaven, here's what she said. She said, The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all others cluster. It's interesting, the older Ellen White got, the more focused she was upon the centrality of Christ. She herself developed in her understanding of the atonement and the work of God. And she writes and says, I present before you the great, grand monument of mercy, generation, salvation, and redemption, the Son of God uplifted on the cross of Calvary. And then she says this, this is to be the theme of every discourse. So Ellen White's buried in Battle Creek, and I would say to her, if she could hear me, she can't, Ellen White, I'm trying to live by what you just said. It's to be the theme of every discourse. Why is that? So one of the stories I remember, and I won't say his name, but some of you in this audience know who this is. There was a leader in the Pacific Union who is now deceased, and I can remember uh, him as a very gregarious, happy person. And he wore wonderful ties. And I can remember uh, back when I was working at the Nevada-Utah Conference as president, I remember that he was traveling in our territory, and he had a heart attack. And he ended up in a hospital in Salt Lake City. And he tells the story that as he was there lying in the hospital bed, he thought, I have been on all kinds of committees and boards. I've held meetings. I have done all kinds of seemingly important things in the name of God as an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister. But he recounts that when he was laying there in the hospital, in nothing but one of those embarrassing hospital gowns with things stuck in his arms 
having to get help to go up to use the bathroom, nothing but boring television to watch. He had his Bible with him, and he said this, I only realized, I realized again at this moment that the only thing that mattered was my relationship with Jesus. The rest of it didn't matter. That had a real effect on me when I heard him tell that story. He's passed to his rest now, but I will tell you that his testimony lives on because I've just shared it with you. Because there's only one thing that matters at the end. All of our activity, all of our attempted obedience, all of the good things that we try to do, all the tours you lead, all the uh, Bible studies that you may give, in the end, will only account for nothing. Because all that matters is, is that when Jesus was lifted up to me and to you, what did you respond with? George Vandeman tells a story that goes back a few years. It's kind of fun. George Vandeman's daughter, Connie, works in our office, Connie Jeffrey. And Connie is a very winsome, happy person. She was actually part of our team. Uh, she was the bus mom, we called her, for uh, the Southern California side of our tour with our world leaders. Her father, George Vanneman, tells this story. In May 21, on May 21, 1946, the place is Los Alamos. Los Alamos. A young and daring scientist is carrying out a necessary experiment in preparation for the atomic test that will be conducted in the waters of the South Pacific Atoll of Bikini. The U.S. blew up a lot of bombs on Bikini Island Atoll. He had successfully performed the experiment many times, and in his efforts to determine the necessary amount of uranium-235 for a chain reaction, scientists call this a critical mass, he would push the two hemispheres together then, just as the mass of these two uranium masses became critical, he'd push them apart with a screwdriver. Doesn't sound very high-tech now. And he's then instantly stopped the chain reaction. But that day, just as the material became critical, the screwdriver slipped. The hemispheres of uranium came too close. Instantly, the room was filled with a dazzling bluish haze. And young Lewis Slotten, instead of ducking and getting out and thereby saving himself, he tore the two hemispheres apart with his bare hands and interrupted the chain reaction. But at that instant, in his self-forgetful daring, he saved the lives of seven other people. They took him in a car to the hospital sat quietly with his companions, and he said to them, you'll come through all right, but I haven't the faintest chance for myself. It's all too true. And nine days later, he died in agony of radiation poisoning. So what's the lesson? Nineteen centuries ago, the Son of God walked directly into sin's most concentrated radiation right here. He allowed himself to be touched by its curse, and it took his life. But by that act, he broke the chain reaction of sin. He stopped it dead in its tracks. He broke its power. And Jesus says, today, if I am lifted up, I will draw all to me. So we're at Elmshaven um, Wednesday, and you may know how Ellen White um, began to decline physically. One day, as she was going from her bedroom, she tripped over the threshold between her bedroom and the hall and fell 
and she broke her hip. And so they put her in a bed, and for some time she lingered, and there was, she got sicker and weaker, and eventually came to her last moments. And you always wonder, and of course you can go there, and there's the bed where she lay, the room where she was, and as she was there, and those that were with her said that these were her last words. So what would you think they'd be? You know, last words are very important. It, it says what was important to you in your life. You know, tell my family I love them. Uh, I'll see you at the tree of life in the new earth. Here's what Ellen White said. Her last words before she closed her eyes and died in 1915 were, I know in whom I have believed. Isn't that great? I know in whom I believed. See, even a lady who spent her whole life serving God, doing amazing things, she had visions. She saw other planets in vision. She wrote the great controversy and everything that happened. But at the end of her life, None of that was important that she'd written all those books or helped found the Seventh-day Adventist Church, God's remnant people movement at the end of time. What mattered to her was, I know in whom I have believed. I love that about her. And the same Jesus that spoke to her speaks to you now. Do you know in whom you believe is it sealed up and safe right now between you and Jesus? It can be. It must be. And all you must do is say yes. That's it. Yes to Jesus. And all the rest follows wonderfully. Let's pray. Jesus, you said if we would look at you lifted up that we would be drawn to you. There's so much that keeps us sometimes from seeming like we can follow you and live faithfully and, and overcome the things in our lives that uh, are difficult for us. You know our history and you know our failings and you know the difficulties that have come and the things that disappoint us. And yet I know, Lord, that today that you say, bring all that to me. Let me draw you to me, says Jesus. I thank you for the promise that says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Thank you for the gift of the rest of Jesus today, for my friends here, for our global friends of Seventh-day Adventists who are around this planet today who are worshiping. And may we help to lift Jesus up to those around us. Come soon, Lord Jesus, is our prayer, for we pray in your name. Amen.